Hey everyone, welcome to the Snapcast. I'm Rob. I'm Jerry. And I'm Abe. And welcome to episode two of So You Want to Play Magic or episode 153 of the Snapcast. And um, for those of you here on YouTube, welcome. Thank you. If you're not on YouTube and you're on iTunes or Spotify, we have a video for this to help describe and show because as we get into how to play magic and in the intricacies of it, it's better to see than just to hear. A lot of people are visual learners. A lot of people can just learn by listening. So that's why we have the two different avenues going with this episode to maximize our ability to teach you the basics of magic. And remember, it is just that. Today, the big things we're going to be talking about are color identity, card design, card types, zones, and then we're going to cover a couple basic mechanics. Okay, there are a ton of mechanics. If you ever have questions about what something is, a quick Google search will definitely help you out. But we're going to be here to help you with some of that. And we're going to be reading directly from the comprehensive rules. So hopefully we get all the information correct as we read it. And we're also going to try to speak plainly because there's a lot of technical language in here and it could get confusing. Just like with anything, you read a contract, you read um, the in-depth on how to fix, say, your computer at home or whatever it may be. There's going to be that technical speak in there, or that jargon, that slang that you might not get. So we're here to kind of translate for the beginner what these things are. And these will help build upon the foundations of then, how do you do a basic turn? What's the stack? What's an ability vice a trigger? When can you respond? When do you have priority? All of that will be encompassed. And hopefully you can grow from a, I have no idea what this card is, to you can look at a card, identify it, understand some of the terms, and know how to play it. Now, I I just want to jump in here, Rob. Obviously, one of the things that we're trying to do is take care of the newer players, right? This is this is a very complicated game. It's a remarkably complicated game. In fact, it is a Turing complete game. And we'll put a link for you guys uh, about that. But essentially what that means is that this game is so complex that you can build a computer system out of it. And it's really remarkable just how deep you can go. There are judges in this game to help with rules interactions. There's a huge rule book, the comprehensive rules, like Rob said, that go into great depth. And what we're gonna try and do is, while we are gonna give you the straight up so that there's no confusion, there's no misleading, we're gonna try and help translate because as newer players, it's often hard to understand all of this jargon, all of these technical terms and all of these complicated bits and pieces. So starting at the beginning, like Rob said, we're gonna have this visual learning because Magic the Gathering is a card game, right? So you're looking at cards, you're looking at items and these items tell you how things work. So we want to make sure that you guys understand how things work as simply as possible, but still give you that little bit of extra depth uh, that the rules provide and not go too deep that you guys get lost. Absolutely, because that's the biggest thing. And if you do have questions throughout any of these videos, please leave a comment, iTunes, Uh, on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, comments down below. Let us know. And real quick, too, for that YouTube plug, be sure if you enjoy this content, hit that like button, hit the subscribe, and click the little bell so that you know when the other episodes of our So You Want to Play Magic series comes out, as well as follow-on content. But let's get going into this. So first, we're going to be talking about color identity. What you see is, uh, this is from a uh, website, tappedout.net. It is a deck building website where you can go to build decks as well as see other decks that your friends have built or other people have built and made public. So you can see what they're playing. It's a great way to get a deck list out. And it even prices it too. It gives you different card values from different websites of what it would cost to build the deck. I just have a few cards here up to try to show 
the various different types of cards you may run into, the different colors, and then we can talk about a few things as we go through this. So the main colors in Magic the Gathering, there are five of them. Red, green, black, blue, and white. Those are the five colors. Okay, and they're identified by the mana symbol and their cost. You can also see on the border of the card too. You can see on the border of the card, it's color identity. Now there is one specific instance, Devoid. You may see color in the mana cost, but it will have a statement down here in the text box that says Devoid, this spell is colorless. So just be mindful of that, read the card. It will tell you everything you need to know. On your card, you have the name of it. Monastery Swift Spear, Reality Smasher, Jace the Mind Sculptor. And then we have the mana cost. So before we get into the mana cost, what is mana? Mana is generated from playing lands. You have different types of lands. Basic lands being islands, mountains, swamps, forests, and plains, as well as wastes, which was a very specific and special basic land that came out during the Battle for Zendikar and uh, Oath of the Gatewatch sets. And then you have your non-basic lands. And to identify the difference between the two, a basic land will state, as we have here on this island, basic land, island. If it doesn't state that, just know that those five or those six are basic lands. Your uh, one, one, key, one key thing to note is that lands, all of them, no matter what color they produce, even even if it doesn't say it on the card, have no color identity. They are colorless. Yes. Lands are colorless cards. They don't gain color unless an effect says that it gains a color. Yep. And that, that is a easy misconception that we make. I made that mistake. Um, I can't remember what deck I was playing, but it was at an FNM. When I played a card, I had to reveal a card of a certain color in order to reduce its mana cost or um, for an effect to occur. Well, I decided, hey, I'm going to reveal this land. And that's when I learned lands are colorless. And then you have non-basic lands. Now to add this mana, you do what's called tapping the card or turning it sideways. That adds mana and it will tell you what it adds. Now your basic lands, they no longer have the text on there. It is assumed now that you tap it to add blue mana or red mana, whatever source it may be. Some lands may have additional abilities like what we have here. Okay, this land mutavolt can become a creature. We'll get more into different abilities that lands can have. Some lands may add multiple mana. Uh, you have your bounce lands from the original Ravnica block, which can add one, um, like two mana, one of uh, one color and one of another. You have some lands that can filter or produce multiple types based on, again, additional costs. And those are all in those sets. There's a lot we could talk about, but we don't want to dive too deep. So as you tap... The important thing we want to hit on here is that lands add mana mana cast spells yep and without mana you cannot cast spells in one form or fashion unless the spell is a zero cost spell some of those do exist so up top it will tell you what you need here for monastery swift spear one red mana <clears throat> jace the mind sculptor has a the number two and then two blue mana so for that one you must have two blue mana in your mana pool and then two mana of any color or generic mana. Now, Rob just mentioned the word mana pool. To help you out uh, understand this is if you physically had to put all the pieces of the board together, and I mean every single possible piece, you tap the land sideways. Say you want to add one blue to your mana pool with your island. You tap your island sideways. And you could actually have a physical, like, let's say a little dish in front of you. And it could say, mana pool in it, and you put a little blue bead in it. That now sits in your mana pool until you spend it or move to the next phase. Correct. Um, now, one of the things about the mana pool is that when Magic the Gathering was first created, 
it was a very high fantasy flavored game. So mana pool was the term used and it was essentially representing when you tap this land, when you turn this land sideways to give yourself with the island an example, one blue mana, you had this mystical vortex of energy swirling around since you are a sorcerer casting spells you are a planeswalker and in order to cast these spells you need mystical power and mystical resources so these lands represent your resources and the mana pool represents the energy well where the resources go uh obviously magic has kind of moved away from that super high fantasy flavor and toned it down to make it a more digestible experience for newer players. So you won't often hear the term mana pool thrown around in, in modern magic circles anymore. Um, just know that it exists. And that is technically what happens when you tap a land, but just for the sake of simplicity, it's a resource-based game, and your lands create the resources, which allow you to use your cards. And mana may come from multiple sources other than lands. You may have creatures that can be tapped to add mana. You may have artifacts that may be tapped to add mana, and there may be additional costs associated with that. Like here on this uh, artifact, Springleaf Drum, I can tap this, and that's what that symbol represents right here, is tapping it, and then tap an untapped creature you control to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So it's not just lands that can produce mana. There are, some is called them mana rocks for the artifacts, a type of card, or mana dorks, or the creatures that can generate mana. And again, there are multiple ways it can go about, but most of the time, your mana will be produced from lands. Every single card type in the history of the game has had at least one card that adds mana. Little knowledge bit for you guys for today. But the important thing is, is that lands generate mana. So let's go back to our creature here, Monastery Swiss Spear. So you have the title, you have the mana cost. Or... Which is now known as mana value yep uh, it's a term that wizards of the coast picked up recently because converted mana cost is a bit of a mouthful sometimes so it's a little easier just to say mana value we may switch between the two they are both the same thing that is one of the things about magic is because it is such a, a deep game and it has been around for so long there have been a great many changes made to it over the time. And for those of us who have been playing for a very long time, some of these changes are new and it's difficult to adapt them or uh, break your habit of what you know. So forgive us if we use the wrong term occasionally. We are learning alongside you guys and because this game is constantly growing, so are we. Exactly. And that's one of the biggest things with it is it is an ever-changing game. Terminologies change sometimes. The meaning may change a little bit. But for the most part, this is a game that you can put down, pick back up, and be able to get back into it and enjoy. So below that, then, there's always some wonderful piece of art associated with the card. Um, here, you got a beautiful drawing. And it even gets the artist down on the bottom. This is a Steve Argyle did the art for Monastery Swiss Spear. And then just for this particular card, in, a, in an example, I know we're discussing a bunch of cards, but there is a uh, YouTube video, which we will link, that is Steve Argyle. Uh, showing us from start to finish how he created the art piece for this card. It's a wonderful watch. It's very neat to see the design and then it evolve from a simple drawing, you know, sketches to this magnificent piece of art that we have in front of us. Um, 
it's a very cool concept. And it's one of those things that when you look at a magic card, you see all of these words, all of these texts, you're thinking about the playability of it. You know, the art is often just a placeholder, but it's a piece of art that was created just for this card. And a lot of people don't pay enough attention or recognize that it gets overlooked. So uh, don't, don't overlook that. You know, some of these cards are really beautifully illustrated and the art can be just as enjoyable as the card itself. Absolutely. And then one thing I want to cover real quick with the mana cost or the mana value is there was a set future site where some of the mana value is over on the left hand side. So if you don't see it in the upper right hand corner, as we see here, and it is a future site card, you may want to check to see if it's over here. Again, there are some cards that have no mana value. Take a look at the lands we have down here. They have none. That's fine too. It just means there, that there's no mana cost associated with that. There is a cycle of sorceries that exists that have no mana value in the top right hand or left hand corner. Yep. And again, these are specific instances. And um, if you want us to cover them, we can. We may cover them in a later episode. But 99% of the cards will look like this. Next up, we have the type, subtype, and super type of our card. And there's multiple different types you can run into. Lands, creatures, instants, sorceries, enchantments, artifacts, planeswalkers, tribal, and so many more. And especially when you start getting into the super and subtypes with humans, Eldrazi, um, vehicles. There's a plethora out there for you. To identify the difference between a type, subtype, and super type, there is only one super type in Magic that is legendary. So if you uh, close out on this one and open up Jace the Mind Sculptor, Rob, uh, this one has the legendary super type. That is the only super type in Magic the Gathering uh, as of the recording of this video. The type itself, out, out, when you take legendary out of that, the type for Jace is Planeswalker. You will know that it, that's the type of the card because it is to the left of the hyphen. And then with the hyphen, after that comes any subtypes that are applicable. Uh, if a card has no subtype, there will be no hyphen. It will only have its type then. Next then, we have the set symbol. And the set symbol identifies two things for us. What set was this card printed in? This is good for keeping track on what formats you can play the card in as well as its color will tell you the rarity. So is it a common, uncommon, rare, or mythic? And these are identified by the colors. Commons, it will be a black set symbol. Uncommons, it will be a silver set symbol like we see here. For rare, it will be gold. For mythic, it will be like a burnt orange. Or in Time Spiral Remastered, new set we have coming out, you also have purple. Occasionally, you'll see them veer away from the common set symbol being black to white. You see that in the uh, the basic land you have on the on field here. This is still common. Uh, they just changed it from black to white to show the design of that set symbol. And another thing, too, I am going to jump a little bit on the card. But if you can't tell what it is on the newer cards, all the way down in the bottom next to the card number, it will have a U, an R, a C, or an M to identify it. The older cards don't have that. You can see that there has been an evolution in what the card looks like. Uh, Time Spiral Remastered shows off the original look of the cards. And then it was, what, 8th edition is when they had the modern design come out, correct? Yep. Another thing to note is that older cards, earlier than a certain set, uh, do not have this distinguishing factor for... Uh, the cards. You cannot tell the rarity of the cards based on the set symbol. The set symbol is the same for all the cards, and the only way to know whether it's a common, an uncommon, or a rare, because Mythic did not exist back then, is to either know the set or to look it up, because there is nothing on the card itself that will designate it. So what was the first set that used the the color coding 
I could tell you Exodus was the set. Exodus, where they was uh, where they started with the colors. Yes, where they had a okay. gold border, where they had the gold symbol in the far right hand side to show rare. Then we get to the text box, and the text box is going to give you what the card does, any abilities associated with the card, any um, those can be activated or triggered abilities, and then it may also have flavor text. So the abilities you can see here um, on Monastery Swiss Spirit, we have what's called Haste. Okay, and we're going to talk about all the different abilities here a little bit later. Sometimes it will tell you what Haste means. Like right here with Prowess, it tells me what Prowess is. Some cards will have this, other cards will not. Again, if you have questions about it, if you're at an f &M, if you're in a tournament scene, ask the question. Don't just assume you know or assume your opponent is correct on how a card works or what a, uh, an ability is. A lot of them are very common, though, like haste. Haste is a common one, and I'll go ahead and cover it now. A creature with haste is not affected by what is called summoning sickness. A creature with summoning sickness cannot be used that turn by itself. I think that's the best way to put it. You can't tap it to activate an ability that it owns, and it cannot attack. It is there. Almost like uh, jet lagged in a way, because you got to think you summoned this creature. It came from a portal or the ether, and it's there in front of you, ready to fight. But it, it needs a minute to get its footing and whatnot, and then, okay, yeah, I'm ready to go. Creatures with haste, you can see they're coming out ready to go already. And then you can see here with prowess, it talks about whenever you cast non-creature spells, it gets an effect. A plus one, plus one until end of turn. Um, some creatures may have additional um, text associated with it, like Reality Smasher, where if it becomes the target of a spell an opponent controls, you counter that spell unless its controller discards a card. So now it has like a protective feature. It may have amplifying creatures or effects for other creatures. And you can start looking at these to kind of build your deck. Oh, I want a deck with nothing but haste creatures. Or I want a deck with a bunch of big creatures. Um, trample, infect, and we'll get into all of these later. But these are different ways you can go about your deck building process is seeing what do my cards have in common and make a theme out of it. Beyond that then, you get into uh, the power and the toughness. So here we see five and five separated by a forward slash. The first number is its power or its attack value. When this creature deals damage to another creature, a player, or a planeswalker, that's how much damage it deals to it. The second value is its toughness. If a creature ever receives that amount of damage or more, it dies, unless it has indestructible, at which point it cannot die. But that is the best way to put about it. So if this Monastery Swiss Spear blocked this Reality Smasher, and we'll get into blocking and attacking later, the Swiss Spear, having one power, will not kill this Reality Smasher. But this Reality Smasher will absolutely kill Monastery Swiss Spear. And that damage will linger until the end of the turn. That is something that we'll talk about later on too in the basic turn, how long damage stays on it. Because then later in that turn, you can kill that creature with other spells or abilities that you may have. Now, I think it's important to note that uh, the power and toughness notations are only applicable to creatures, as we saw on Reality Smasher and Monastery Swiss Spear, both have a power and a toughness. Now, if you look on the screen and you look for Smuggler's Copter, which Rob will show you here in a second, that has a power and a toughness as well, even though you can see on the text line it is an artifact and not a creature but the card itself has an ability. You have to meet certain conditions in order to turn it into a creature. So when it becomes a creature, it gains that power and toughness line that you see there. But those are the only cards that have a power and a toughness. So that is one of the ways that you can, at a quick glance or you know a brief look, you can figure out what cards are creatures you can designate the creatures very quickly 
by noticing the power and toughness. Now, one, the one exception to this rule is, as we discussed with Smuggler's Copter, if you meet certain conditions, it becomes a creature. So Mutavault here, which is a land, which is not a creature, has an ability where you can turn it into a creature for the turn, at which point it gains a power and a toughness, which is designated in the text here. However, the card itself does not show you the power and toughness like the creature card does, where it has it very clearly printed. So that's one of the things that you have to pay attention to. And over time, it becomes second nature. You understand exactly how that fits. But as you start, as you begin to play the game, it might be confusing and it might get kind of uh, tangled up. So one of the most common expressions you'll hear, and you'll hear me use this throughout this whole series, is reading the card explains the card. And obviously, you have to understand the rules and the mechanics for that to hold true. But once you have a basic grasp, reading the card explains the card. One thing I want to double back to cover. So with our mana costs, sometimes it gives us a straight value, like right here, two and two blue. Sometimes a mana cost will be X. It is variable. It is what you choose it to be. And then in the card text, it will tell you additional items. Some cards have a mana cost of XX. That means that however much mana you spend on it, you divide by two. That equals your value for X. That now, on those cards, X has to be the same for both X's. So you can't, one X is three and one X is two. It correct. doesn't work like that. Both X's have to be, if it was going to be three, then X is three and X is three. Yep. And that would cost six mana total. If there's three X's, it's the same way each X value must equal the same. That way, you know what you're getting out of the card. Just think of how many X's are in the mana cost. Okay, if there's two, my total mana spent must be a, an even number at that point or divisible by the number of X's and result in a whole number. Some now, I know this sounds a lot like your algebra class and... We, we all know how enjoyable those are, and this is supposed to be a fun game. So, Rob, Jerry, Abe, why, why is there algebra in my Magic the Gathering? I hate it. Why is it there? Well, it leads to interesting gameplay, and once you get the handle of it, it's less complicated because you understand. So don't be scared just because there's some X's there's some unique values on some of these cards. It might be a little hard to understand at first, but once you once you grasp it, it's very simple. Yes. And one other value I want to express on a card here before we move on to the different card types and go a little bit more in depth on them is when it comes to Planeswalkers, they do not have a power and toughness on the card unless an ability grants them a power and toughness. Instead, they have what is called loyalty. The number in the bottom right is the amount of loyalty a Planeswalker starts with. As you use that Planeswalker, you can see there are multiple abilities and they all have a cost. Either adding two loyalty to your Planeswalker so this would take Jace's loyalty up to five if you use its first ability. A loyalty ability that may cost zero, so you neither gain nor lose loyalty. Or that results in you spending loyalty to activate. When a Planeswalker's loyalty equals zero, they are destroyed. If a Planeswalker is attacked or targeted by a spell that deals damage, that amount of damage results in loss of loyalty equal to the damage it would receive. I think one other important thing to, to note here is that, for example, with Jace the Mind Sculptor here, he has three loyalty when he enters the battlefield. And you'll notice that the bottom ability uh, costs negative 12, meaning 
you have to remove 12 loyalty counters from Jace in order to use that ability. Now, you, you are only able to use that ability if you can actually pay the cost. So you see he has three. You can't take 12 loyalty counters from three. He has to have enough for you to actually remove all 12 of those. So at a minimum, in order to use that ability, he would have to have 12 loyalty counters in order to remove 12 loyalty counters. Now, in that instance, he would go from 12 to zero. When you activate it, he would be destroyed, like Rob said, and placed into the graveyard, which is a zone we'll discuss uh, a little later on. If, for example, he has 13 loyalty counters and you use that negative 12, you remove 12 counters, he would be left with one and the ability would be used. Correct. Planeswalkers are a newer card in the world of magic, first introduced in Lorwyn. Uh, so when I first started playing magic back in Torment Judgment Odyssey, these weren't a thing. And this is one of the, I think, trickier things that some newer players have a problem with dealing with. Like, what is a Planeswalker? What can I do with a Planeswalker? And we'll talk about that here next in card types. You said this is a newer card type. And you are correct for folk like you and I, Jerry. We've been playing for a very long time. And when we started playing, Planeswalkers weren't cards. They were, they were, they were just uh, descriptors or flavor. But in Lorwyn they introduced it as an actual card type. And just to make you feel real, real old, because I know this things when I look at it, uh, Lorwyn was released in 2007. So while it is a newer card type for Magic the Gathering, it's been around since 2007. It's, it's... 2021. That was 14 years ago. So we're old. What's uh, interesting too right now, we can say Planeswalkers have been around for half the life of Magic at this point. Wow. Things certainly change. And oh, it's yes. very interesting to see how they change. But, you know, it's one of those things. Like you, you said, this card, this card type has not been around uh, for that long. It's one of the newer card types. But it's been around for 14 years. And that is something... Just because you and I, folks like ourselves who have been playing this game for so long, we have that point established in our minds and it's hard to see it any other way. As a newer player, one of the benefits of coming into the game is all the cards that you're going to see already exist. They're there, they've already been created. So when you start playing Magic, they're just cards to you you don't have to to worry about new card types being added that confuse you because you're an old fogey like we are uh there will be new cards added in the future since magic is a living game and they continue to add new cards and new sets but at that point once you've finished all of the episodes that we put out for you and asked us all the questions that you have and we're more than happy to answer, you will be able to handle those releases, those new cards, because you'll know enough about magic to be able to deal with it. So even though the card's 14 years old, for you, it's just another card, but there will be a time when a card is released and you go, man, what the heck is that? And we will be there for you to help you out. Absolutely. And go back on uh, color identity for cards. Cards aren't just monocolored. They're not just one color. There are two color sets or guilds that exist. There are wedges or tricolors out there. And those cards are identified with instead of blue, red, white, black, green, they're gold on the card art on the outside. And they so, can also be hybrid based where in the event that the card can be paid for all of one color or all of the other color or a mix. And it'll even show in the art of that card where instead of it's being gold, it might be blue on one half, black on the other half. Yep. 
those would be represented with a split mana symbol. So instead of just an island, it might be half island, half swamp, or half mountain color, like what you have here on Monastery Swiss Spear, and half forest. Those can be paid with either one to satisfy that one requirement, and then whatever else the rest of the mana cost is. All right, so let's get to the card types. We've already gone through the list of them, but there's a distinction between a couple of them. And those are permanents and what is considered a permanent. A permanent is a card that when cast or played stays on the battlefield. Now, Rob, what is the battlefield? Ooh, the battlefield is one of the many zones that exist in Magic the Gathering. Here you can see we have a bunch of different outlines on our screen. I've got a large one here, which has uh, what, seven cards or nine cards on display. That is the battlefield. The battlefield is an open information zone. What that means is you're allowed to read any card that's on the battlefield, whether it's your side or your opponent's side, that is face up. If it is a face up card, you have access to the information on that card. There is no hidden information there. If you need to read it, ask your opponent to read it. If for whatever reason they refuse to let you read it, you can call a judge. You can ask, hey, what is the text on that card? So then you can understand it. And this is your battlefield. Typically, your battlefield is laid out with your lands in the back closest to you and your permanents in front of your lands, mainly your creatures, your planeswalkers, artifacts you can put elsewhere off on the side. Same with your enchantments. That is one of the zones that exist in Magic the Gathering. So these permanents, like I, um, as stated, when cast, will remain on the field until removed by an effect or spell that causes it to be destroyed, sacrificed, or just gets removed from play. Some spells may produce tokens, which can enter the battlefield then. And um, tokens are just a named card, may have a power toughness, may be an artifact token that has an ability. And these tokens can be received in different packs. Um, you can buy them individually. Or, depending on what it is, you can just use a die to represent what that token is. Be clear to identify what that token is, because there are some decks that produce a multiple amount of tokens of different varieties, or just a large amount in general. And you need to keep track of which ones came out this turn, or which ones have been out from the previous turn. Just keep that in mind. Token, to be more specific, tokens are permanents that are created by either other spells or permanents that have no converted mana cost or mana value. And when a token leaves the battlefield, it is destroyed. Yeah, it, the, the easiest explanation for tokens is when they leave the battlefield, they cease to exist. Depending on how they leave the battlefield, if, for example, it is a creature token and you kill it, it goes to the graveyard in a technical sense, but because it is a token, the moment it leaves the battlefield, it ceases to exist. However, it still moves from the battlefield to the graveyard. Now, in this sense, graveyard in Magic the Gathering means your discard pile or uh, cards that have been used, and we'll talk about that uh, later on but it's another zone in the game. And when cards are placed in there, they are, in, in a general sense, done. You've used the card. Now tokens are special because as a token, they're not a real card. Like Rob said, you can use a die to represent them. You can use a, a card sleeve. You can use the actual token that come in booster packs or uh, specialty packs and specifically represent that card, that token. But um, when, they, when they leave the battlefield, they cease to exist. There are obviously some special circumstances where that is not a, an appropriate explanation but for simple terms, for beginning players, that's usually the easiest way to describe it. Exactly. 
So speaking of zones, let's go ahead and move into the different zones. And we're gonna go one by one. The first zone I would like to talk about is the library. The library is your deck. Um, I don't have a deck here uh, on this screen, but I can pull one up for you. Jerry, you're gonna like the deck I'm gonna be opening here. All right, I like it. <laughs> All right. So the deck I have on display is called Dredge. Okay, currently you see what would be the start of a game. The battlefield is empty. Your library was shuffled, presented to your opponent for their own shuffling or cutting, and then you drew your hand. So we have two zones on display right now. We have the library, which is an unknown randomized zone. It may become, some parts of it may be known. That being if you put a card on the bottom that you got to look at, or if you got to reveal a card from the top or look at the card from the top of the library. Now, when does a card leave the library zone? Jerry or Abe? The, a card leaves the library zone if you were to, in, most, in every case of Magic the Gathering, when you enter your draw phase and you draw a card. Yeah. There are also other opportunities for it to leave the library zone. For example, there are some cards that say, uh, put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Those at that point, you would, uh, they would leave the library zone and enter the graveyard zone. So for example, this card here, Shriekhorn, states that when you use its ability, target player, and target player means you can target yourself, puts the top two cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard, meaning you take the top two cards of your deck, your library, and you reveal them and place them into your graveyard. One, two. It's relatively simple. It's just basic game mechanics. Now this deck is uh, unique in the way that it plays, but we're not really going to discuss the functionality of this deck at this point. We're just trying to explain to you the basic mechanics, the basic zones. So you draw a card. That means it leaves the library zone and enters your hand. You move cards from your library to your graveyard. In an, an event like Shriekhorn being activated, it leaves the library zone and enters the graveyard. Uh, there are also other effects you'll see on the furthest right where it says exiled. It's another zone, the exile zone. There are some cards or some effects that say, take the top two cards of your library and exile them. Rather than put them in your graveyard, you put them in the exile zone. And uh, we'll discuss that at a later point. But, Rob? As for, as for a functional rule of the game, drawing a card from the library on your draw phase is the only time a card is moved until another card says otherwise. And the exile zone may also, like whenever you put a card into exile, sometimes a card might not say exile this card. It may use the term remove it from the game. As you can see here on conflagrate, it talks about an additional cost that it has, and it talks about where you may play it from. And then it says remove it from the game. In this aspect, it would go to the exile zone. Now, Remove from the game is simply exile this card, but it's just older rules text. Exactly. Uh, as, as Magic the Gathering has evolved, so have the cards, so have the rules. We've discussed that in different spots, but one of the rules changes has been it no longer says remove from the game. It now says exile, which means put it in the exile zone. And... They have done a good job of updating a lot of cards. So on newer printings of these cards, for example, uh, Conflagrate, the card that Rob was talking about, if you look at the newest printing of it, it will say instead of uh, remove this card from the game, it will say exile instead. But the older cards will still have the older text on them and it might be confusing it might be 
a little bit off-putting when you read them because you don't understand what that rules text means. Um, just know that there are resources available to you, which we will discuss later on, such as Gatherer or the comprehensive rules. Uh, and they will explain these changes. They will tell you what the card says in modern terminology. Absolutely. Now the graveyard and the exile zone are both open information zones. Again, meaning that you can go through and see what cards exist there. This is great if you have a spell that can target a card in a graveyard, or if you wanna to try to next level, figure out how many copies are left in a deck. And we'll get into deck building in that later. But you can use this to gain a lot of information. What's in the graveyard? What's in exile? The library is not an open information zone. You cannot look at someone's library unless a card explicitly states you may search their library. Or a player has a card that says they may search their own library. That zone is a unknown zone. The only information that can be gathered from the library is how many cards are left. And this really comes into play in like a war of attrition against two control decks that are just draw go, draw go. All right, I've got this many cards left in my deck. You have this many cards left in your deck. I'm going to win before you do. Very rarely does it get to that point. There was for a little bit, but again, that's something we can talk about later. In most cases, the battlefield, graveyard, and exiled are open information, but there are instances where cards break that rule. So as a friendly reminder, cards break the rules of the game. The rules of the game are laid out for us. Yep. And if you run into that instance where a card contradicts a rule, the card takes precedence over the written rule. So for example... There are a couple of cards in Magic the Gathering that say, exile this card face down. What that means is that this card, whatever card has been exiled face down, enters the exile zone, but it enters face down, meaning that it is still hidden information. It's a face down card. You're looking at the back of the card. You cannot see the front of the card, which means that no player is allowed to look at the front of that card because it's still face down. And this is obviously a gameplay mechanic. You'll find it useful in certain circumstances. But mechanically speaking, from the rules standpoint, because it is a face down card, you're not allowed to look at it unless it explicitly states that you are allowed to look at it when it's face down. So exile this card face down means that no player is allowed to look at it. If the card said exile this card face down, you may look at it at any time. That's a different rule altogether because it specifically states that even though it is face down, which typically means nobody's allowed to look at it because it's hidden information it's face down the rule of the card says it's face down but you can look at it so you have to recognize as you're playing magic that essentially the cards are shifting the rules of the game as you play and you have to be aware of the basic mechanics which we will be working on but that each card you play has the ability to change how the game works in a slight way. And it can get very complicated and it can be very simple, like what we saw with Shriekhorn. Put two cards from your library into the graveyard. That's changed the game a little bit because you've now moved cards from one zone to another. They were previously hidden and now it's open information all of a sudden. That's a, that's a huge shift mechanically speaking, gameplay speaking, but in the real sense of the game, it's not really a huge change. You've just moved two cards from one zone to another. So just be 
uh, aware of the fact that there will be a lot of things going on in a typical game of magic and keeping track of those things is your responsibility as the player. Correct. And I'm going to switch screens back over to our other deck here, our amount of cards for the next um, zone to talk about, and that is the hand. Your hand is a zone that only you can look at unless an opponent has a spell or ability that reveals your hand. Spell I have here, Thoughtseize, does just that. And it says, target player reveals their hand. You may choose a non-land card from it, and then that player discards it, you lose two lives. So it tells you what the card does. Now, this doesn't mean you play the game with your hand revealed. It is only for this spell, you reveal it. After they're done with the spell, so after they've chosen a card for you to discard, your hand goes back to being private information. Only you can see it. They are allowed to write down what they saw. They can take notes. One thing to be mindful with notes, if you are able to search an opponent's library, do not write down their entire deck. You will get warnings. You will probably get disqualified from the event. I've seen it happen. The hand, or that zone can be temporarily revealed, and then it goes back to being hidden information. The hand has a maximum size. Uh, you can only have up to seven cards in your hand, unless another card says otherwise. Yep, and we'll talk more on that uh, when we go through the basic turn, because there may be times when you draw greater than seven, and then there's a certain point in your turn where you must discard down to your maximum hand size. And now the last zone I want to talk about, and that is the stack. The stack is a zone between a spell being resolved or a permanent being on the battlefield and while it's in your hand, or an ability before it resolves. We are going to do an entire segment on the stack in the next episode. I don't want to get into it right now because it is a lot. But know the stack is another zone where cards can interact with one another. I think that's the best like intro we can do for that, right? Yep. Okay. And again, we're just going to leave it at that. So if you want to hear about the stack, definitely come back next episode where we go through a basic turn in the stack. And then there's a few other just basic mechanics, things we want to talk about. Life totals. Your life total starts at 20 at the beginning of a game for a standard uh, game of Magic, unless you're playing Commander, where the rules change what your beginning life total is. So based on the style of Magic you're playing, your life total may change, but for simplistic sake, we're going to say it starts at 20, because that's what most of them starts at. Okay, your deck size is just whatever your starting deck count or library count is before you draw your hand. Um, you may hear terms like win cons. How are you going to win the game? Do you have like one spell that can win the game for you? Uh, last episode, we talked about a deck called Battle of Wits. That card by itself is a win con. Jace the Mind Sculptor can be seen as a win con. Or my creatures can be seen as a win con. Now, Rob, I'm going to jump in here real quick, and yeah. this is another episode that we're going to have, and we're going to be talking about Magic the Gathering jargon yep. or terminology. And now we mentioned in the last episode, there is an entire language for this game, and you will eventually pick it up. But Rob here has been saying WinCon, and you might not understand what that means and it's a very simple explanation. WinCon is just an abbreviation for win condition. So a way that you can win the game. How do you win your game of magic? So you use one of your win conditions. And saying win condition over and over and over takes a little bit of extra time. So it has been shortened in magic jargon to wincon, which is the same concept. It's the same words. It's just an abbreviation, but you'll hear it very frequently amongst magic players. And like I said, we're going to have an entire segment devoted to the language, the jargon, the magic speak. But just for that moment, uh, that's what that means. Absolutely. 
But I think that's where we're going to cut it on this episode. This has been a lot of information for the new player. Um, Hopefully, you're able to absorb it. You're able to understand it with visualizations we're giving you, the explanations. And definitely stick around for the next one because we're going to go through a basic turn. From I have my deck, it is shuffled, to drawing my hand, to going through all of the phases. And there's a lot of phases in a turn. Uh, 14, technically, if you want to get into it. And then there are phases within those that could occur. And how in-depth we're going to go, I'm not exactly sure yet. But you will have the general understanding of what a full turn in Magic the Gathering is. We're also going to talk about the stack, timing, and priority, as well as what is an activated ability versus what a triggered ability is. And we may have to split that up because it's a lot of information. But we just want to thank everybody again for listening. Again, if you want to follow us and more information that we put out, please check out the Magic Gathering Facebook group. Um, I cannot give them enough attention. Um, One, because I have to, if I want to post our episodes there. But also because (laughs) it is just a really good uh, place to go when it comes to Magic the Gathering information for that entry level stuff. So if you're on Facebook, go there, join the group, ask questions, and you will see very quickly, you will get six, seven responses. And it's almost all going to be the same just because we're eager to teach you. Uh, You can check us out on all podcasting and social media outlets, that being iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud. You can also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and let us know how we're doing. Your feedback really helps us develop our show. So if you are listening to us on iTunes, give us that feedback. Let us know, hey, you know, maybe the episodes are quiet. That is an issue that we've had in the past, but we've now corrected. Or maybe it is you want to hear more in depth on a topic or you want to hear less about a topic. Maybe we're just droning on too much about one thing. Let us know so we can give you the best product that we can. But that's going to do it for us. Y'all have a fantastic day.